I cannot tell you over the last few decades how many times people's physical health has to break down in order for them to realize that the social relationships in their life, they've outgrown them. They have been holding down or suppressing emotions. Their mental thought patterns are very damaging to themselves. The way they talk to themselves is a way that they would never allow anybody else to talk to them. And when we ignore or do not resolve or are unaware of issues going on mentally, emotionally, socially, and spiritually for ourselves, eventually it will show up in your physical body to get your attention. That is from internal medicine physician, Dr. Neha Sanguin on today's podcast, where we talk about burning out. For those of you who are new to the podcast, I'm your host, Brian Keen, online fitness coach, nutritionist, and three-time best-selling author here to help you with all things online online business. I'm getting my podcast fixed up, help you with all things health, fitness, and mindset. Today's podcast, we go deep on burnout. So if you are somebody that struggles with energy levels, you struggle with stress management, and you're not sure about how to navigate through saying no to certain opportunities that are coming your way or people pleasing and saying yes to way too many things, and you are looking for a solution or a cure, a different kind of prescription and solution and cure to dealing with burnout, looking at your food, looking at your sleep, looking at your movement, but also looking at the emotional side of your life, the mental side of your life, the social side, then today's podcast is for you. So without further ado, here is this week's episode with internal medicine physician, Dr. Neha Sanguin on burning out emotional energy drains and why burnout is not a personal failure. It's a wake up call. Enjoy. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the podcast. I am delighted to be joined today with my guest, Neha Sanguin. Dr. Neha, CEO and founder of Intuitive Intelligence, is an internal medicine physician, international speaker, and corporate communication expert. Her private practice in corporate consulting focuses on addressing the root cause of stress, miscommunication, and interpersonal conflict, often healing chronic conditions such as headaches, insomnia, anxiety, and depression. She regularly consults with organizations such as the American Health Association, American Express, and Google, and has shared her keynote presentation on the stages of TEDx. She's the author of the book, Powered by Me, From Burned Out to Fully Charged at Work and in Life. I'm looking forward to talking all things burnout in today's show. Dr. Neha, welcome to the podcast. What an honor to be here. Thank you, Brian. I want to open up with a quote of yours, and this was in the book, but I've also heard you speak about it in several interviews, and that is, contrary to popular belief, burnout is not a liability or a personal failure. It's a wake-up call. To reverse it, you need a different kind of prescription, one that addresses the root cause. Talk to us a little bit about burnout, what it is, and how it's a wake-up call, not a personal failure or liability. Yeah, wow, that was one of the biggest lessons I learned. You know, from the moment we're born, right, we're socialized in our families, in our cultures, in our communities, and in the world about what we think success actually means. And when we forget to de- create our own definition of success, and what we do is chase the world's definition of success, for me, as the middle daughter of immigrants growing up in Michigan, in the United States, in our culture, it was very science based. And so to me, I don't even remember how old I was when people said, Neha, are you going to be an engineer or a doctor? Right. And so I grew up wanting to make my parents proud, make my community proud. I was good at math and science, so they weren't far off. But I never really asked myself, what do I want to become? I knew that if I did those things, I would have a good living, I would help people, and I would make my family and my community proud. So off I went. And so the first thing that I'd say about this is, anybody who's listening, I want you to know none of this is your fault if you're experiencing burnout, but it is your responsibility. It's your responsibility to shift your attention from am I doing this for the rest of the world or am I doing this for me? And that's a harder question to ask because, you know, when I say, oh, my parents and my family and everybody wanted me to do this, there was a period in time where I actually blamed them, where I said, oh, they made me do this. They made me become an engineer, made me become a doctor. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. I was the one who filled out the forms. I'm the one who did the night shifts in the hospital. I'm the one who did the problem sets in engineering. So it means that I wanted something more than what they wanted for me. And that was love, approval, you know, recognition, all of that. So what I'd say 
is it did feel like a failure to me when I was a busy doctor and one day I really burned out and I'll tell you that story in a minute. But what I realize now is it was the wake up call to my truest life. And I now got to see the benefits of my culture, of my parents, what they were saying to me. And now I merge that with who I am. And that's how I'm here with you right now. So it wasn't a big failure that I thought it was. It was just me needing to reorient who I was trying to please, whose definition of success I was trying to meet. So if you're working really hard and you're feeling exhausted, put yourself back in the equation is what I would say. Neha, with burnout, I had a lot of misconceptions around it because when I mm -hmm. think 36 hour shifts fueled by sugar and caffeine and this is what you did in your <laughs> early 30s and, and that's what happened. I can kind of wrap my brain around, of course your body's going to burn out, but sure. there's quite, quite a spectrum of, of burnout course. for people and there's going to be yellow flags before there's red flags. There's going to be warning signals before you get to full blown burnout. Talk to us a little bit about your experience and some of the yellow flags you ignored that people tend to ignore along the way. And then we'll talk about some of the prescriptions for resolution for solution sure. around it, but just to paint that picture for people. You bet. So here's the thing. Burnout is, is defined as a triad. So the first is exhaustion, physical, mental, emotional exhaustion. And it's usually been going on over time. So you don't wake up on Monday morning fine. And by Friday, you're burned out. It's a much longer process. It takes months, it takes years. Because mother nature is so brilliant, we have all these adjustments that happen in our physiology. We have all these ways that you and I start drinking a cup of coffee in the morning. And then we say, could you make it a double? And we start adjusting to the levels of stress in our lives. So there's physical, mental, emotional exhaustion. So exhaustion is the first pillar. When that goes on for a while and our bodies have adjusted and we've adjusted with coping mechanisms, right? Some people may say, oh, I, I use a glass of, I grab a beer at the end of the day to take the edge off my day. Pretty soon during the pandemic or during, you know, the, the whole experience we all have gone through, maybe you said, just, just hand me the six pack, like give me the whole thing, right? So you start needing more and more of the coping mechanisms, but you don't realize that the stress is going up. So we start adjusting to it. The second pillar is cynicism creeps in. So now all of a sudden you're exhausted. You've been exhausted for a while. And all of a sudden you start to hear yourself silently saying things that undermine you like, it doesn't matter how hard I work. It's never going to make a difference. I'm never going to catch up. This isn't going to matter. Now, when your own mind starts undermining that exhaustion, now you're in trouble. It's almost like walking on the beach and feeling the undertow. You can't see it, but boy, you can feel it. And that's when your mind starts kicking in with cynicism. This is about the time that you'll also be using something called depersonalization, where you start to distance yourself from other people. Even if you're lonely and you need company or you want it, you don't have the energy to be social. And lastly, you hit ineffectiveness where now you're redoing things, you're not as effective as you used to be. And literally, so the way that this happened for me is, I was 33 years old, I walked into the hospital one day, I'm on the final day of my five day rotation at the hospital, so I'm wrapping everything up. Someone calls in sick, there's no backup. They say, Neha, can you take all incoming transfers from all the you know, hospitals around? I said, sure. I didn't even think that maybe I would be overworked or overwhelmed. So one of the things I wanna say, beware of, if you're a person who tries to please other people, you want everybody, you want harmony, you wanna make sure everybody's okay, that can lead you to saying yes to please in the moment, but taking too much on for yourself. Then when I, when I did that, about five hours into my shift, I had only seen two out of 18 patients, and I walked up to the nurse and I said, Nina, could you please get me 40 mil equivalents of IV potassium for the gentleman in 636? And she said, Dr. Sanglan, are you okay? And that was my first indication that I might not be. And I said, yeah, why? And she said, that's the fourth time in under five minutes you've asked me that same question, and I've answered you every time. 
Now, that is a rude wake up to burnout for me because I had conditioned myself so much to push through my body rather than partner with it that I missed all the early signs that something was wrong. I thought being exhausted and tired after a weekend off was normal. I thought the heaviness that I carried around in my body was just the way it was. I started drinking, you know, two ice cold Mountain Dews and a king size Snickers bar. And I thought that was a normal strategy of sugar and caffeine. I call it the sugar caffeine buzz strategy. So what I'd say is, this is the big thing I want people to know. Was burnout my fault? No, it was not my fault, but it is my responsibility. So what do I mean by that? Burnout usually occurs on three levels. Me, we, world. So there's a way in which I'm being asked to do things. And each of you in a world with AI and things moving faster and faster by the minute, we are being called externally in the world to function like machines that don't need rest. And when we are being called to do that, our biology was not meant for that. But what does our world say? Do more with less, faster is better. You, success requires struggle, profit over people. We have all these beliefs in our society that drive things to move faster and faster and faster. So you don't have to be a doctor doing overnight shifts to feel this level of stress in your lives. You just have to be someone who wants to take care of their family, wants to get ahead in their career, wants to be a good parent, wants to be a good friend or daughter uh, or son or husband, right? Like whatever it is that you are in a world moving this fast, you can experience this too. So interesting because there's similarities and we've had completely different life experiences from where you are, where you grew up, what you did to what I did. But there's a lot of overlap there. And that's what's so interesting about it. I remember in 2015 was the time in my life when I burnt out. It was at the time I was competing in bodybuilding shows. I was preparing for a competition, the Worlds in Las Vegas in 2015 in August. My daughter was born that May and I was running my <laughs> online business and it was my first ever six figure year. I used to be an elementary school, primary school teacher. And I remember I started wow. making more money in a month than I was making as a year as a teacher. And that with it came lots of clients and lots of responsibility and lots of appearances. And I remember hitting that wall like every monday to friday i would be fueled off caffeine and stimulants and like i actually even got some prescription based drugs that helped me push on through for like adrenaline and things to just keep me going i was like i can't sleep but like i just don't sleep like that's a waste yep. of time i was like i have to provide for my daughter i have to get to the gym i have to prepare my meals i have to do all these things get back to my clients and every weekend i would just basically pass out for 12 hours, 13 hours sleep on a Saturday and a Sunday, and then repeat the cycle on Monday to the point that by the end of that show in August, I remember being barely able to get out of bed for about six weeks. Just my body had just had this cortisol dump. And I was like, no, it wasn't quite the wake up call, like yep. talking to somebody and repeating as in there was nothing at risk except for myself. But it's amazing how we just tune it out. We basically yeah. just power through and we tune it out. I'm curious because in your book, you've broken up beautifully into like physical energy, emotional energy, um, and you talk about mental energy, spiritual energy, etc. But mm -hmm. what are some of the body's languages or deciphering? You talk about stress and hormones, but deciphering your body's language. What are some of the cues for people that are listening who have either gone through it and don't want to go through it again or who are in the middle of of it right now and are ignoring it like I did in 2015, like you did back when you were in your early 30s. Sure. Talk to us about deciphering the bodies in your body's language. Sure. Well, this whole idea that we talked about, right? Exhaustion, cynicism, ineffectiveness. I give you a really extreme example and I give you mine because I can share my own. I love how you tied it to cultural, to, you know, you're, you're competing, you're trying to have a family, you're, you're just trying to live in a world that's moving this fast. So the small adjustments you make, for you, those are about becoming successful. Those are about being in a world where you wanna provide for the next generation, right? So all of these are such positive intentions, and I want everybody to know that. So when I said to you, there's me, we world, 
what I was saying is there's a way in which we creatively adjust. And so I don't want you to be mad at any of those adjustments. I want you to thank yourself for being so creative that you figured out a way to navigate this world moving way too fast. So that's the first thing. Have grace for yourself. The second thing is there's an environment in which we function, right? It might be your family. It might be your work environment. And there's the larger world. And so when you are part of that me, we world, the way that you are adjusting is one part of it. And that's the part you have control over it. And that's what we're talking about now. So how do you pick up those early signs? Okay. There's the first part of burnout feels like anytime you're up leveling, probably your first child, probably training for that competition, probably, you know, when you realize that you're on a treadmill going a little too fast and it's, it's that sensation. So you might start dropping the ball on things. You might forgetting, start forgetting things. You might stay later. You, you get to work. You're usually an early bird, but now you can't get up in the morning. There's all these things that are happening. And sometimes you don't recognize them, but your partner will, your boss will, your colleague will. They'll say, are you okay? When, the, when or if that happens, it, rather than getting defensive, it would be amazing if you said, wow, thanks. I don't even think I noticed that because people around us are trying to help us. Now, when you start to think through, so that's the alarm phase. Then if you stay on that treadmill for a long time, use all those coping mechanisms, you move into chronic adaptation. That's where most people are. And then there's that moment where one more thing happens like did to me and I go sliding down. And all you're saying is you didn't go sliding down like that. You woke up one day and it was like, this is too much. And I want you to know that the extreme examples allow people to see that it can happen to anyone. But really what I want you to know is it's happening to a majority of our world right now. And so, yes, when I, so for 20 years since this happened, I realized how little the medical world trained me and how little I knew as a doctor about burnout. So people would come to me and I would put them on an antidepressant or I'd give them anti-anxiety or I'd give them sleep meds or something. And I wasn't quite sure about it. And that's because the medical world judged burnout as a failure. And so we didn't want to talk about it. We didn't learn about it. We didn't know about it. Well, now research shows that 63% of frontline physicians in the U.S. are burned out. And if 63% are admitting it, here's what I promise you. It's higher than that. <laughs> so denial's not going to get you anywhere. It's just going to make the numbers keep increasing. You started speaking about deciphering your body's unique language. So in chapter four of Powered by Me that you spoke about in the physical section, the number one thing I want you to do is start to decipher your body's unique language. What do I mean by that? Well, your body's physiology is always adjusting. Your blood pressure's changing, your heart rate's changing. It's changing moment to moment by whatever you're experiencing. And your body is always communicating with you, even right now. The question is, are you listening? Most people, number one, don't know how to listen to it because they're so externally focused. They're, they're paying attention to what the outside world wants. I'm gonna say, let's counterbalance that with your inner world. And here's the benefit. When you pay attention to any place in your body that's constricting, relaxing, feeling calm, feeling light, feeling heavy, those are the earliest signs before anybody else knows in, in the room that something went wrong. Your body is telling you something didn't align with your values, didn't match what you expected, or is just right. And you can sign on the dotted line. Right. So your body is this incredible machine picking up clues everywhere and integrating it in real time. But in order to function in a world moving this fast, you may have had to tune that out because you thought it would have slowed you down. And so what I want you to know right now is what's gotten you here is not going to get you where you're going. Now it's time to tune back into that body. So let's Brian, you and me do this. When I move out of my comfort zone, the unique way my body speaks to me is my throat constricts and my stomach turns. Sometimes my jaw gets tight too. How do you know inside your body 
the, some of the first signs that you're moving out of your comfort zone? I normally get the stomach feeling first. It's interesting because in, at an acute level, I feel it nearly always in my gut or in my stomach, but I have a three check-in system. I call it my three S's so people can take this or they can leave it, but it's suppressed immune system, sleep and sex drive. When I'm about to hit burnout, they're the three things that go in that order. First thing is that I start getting sick regularly. The next thing is that my sleep starts to get affected and then my sex drive plummets. So I know myself that if I keep living the way I'm doing, or excessively training or working too hard or over consuming stimulants, I end up getting that breakdown in that order, but it normally starts with that stomach feeling. So this is brilliant because the most number of nerves, okay, are obviously your brain, spinal cord, your heart, and your gut. You, you, they always say, you know, your brain, your gut is your second brain, right? Mm -hmm. So the reason that's true, of course, any emotional upset, any stress is going to also hit your gut. For some people, it creates constipation. For others, it creates diarrhea. For, for little children, how many times have you heard this? They're playing nicely with their brother or something's going on. They're playing with their toys. And then you say, it's time to go to school. And they say, but I can't because I have a tummy ache. Okay. And then the parent says, I just saw you playing with your toys. You're fine. Get up and go to school right? But you know what the child just told you? They're moving into danger, whether they're getting bullied on the bus, whether they're sitting alone in the lunchroom, whether someone is something into where they're moving showed up in their body instantly. So the tummy ache is not, I'm telling you a story. This tummy ache is their body telling them where you're headed now is not good. Something is causing you to feel that you don't want to be there, protect you. So what's interesting is at a very young age, we have learned ourselves to tune out of our body. Now, this isn't our parents' fault. Our parents didn't know if they knew that our body was talking to us and it was giving them vital information, they would have slowed down and said, tell me what's going on. But they didn't learn that. So it's our job to break that cycle and say, wow, Sounds like your tummy is turning. Tell me what's going on. What's going on on the bus? What's going on at school? What, what, is there ever a time that you're feeling sad? Do you need my help? Do you feel alone? Right? Our body has been talking to us since we were born. It's just that when you're a baby, you cry, you get attention, and everybody comes. But we don't have the language for it. And that's what we need to develop now. Now, I'll tell you, when I don't speak up, I, there's something I need to say, but I'm holding back. My throat constricts almost to the point that I can't breathe. Like it feels like, like I'm, I'm literally needing to take a deep breath in. Now, for those of you that are saying, yeah, it's my stomach too. I want you to really get descriptive on your stomach. Is it butterflies? Is it knots? Is it heaviness? What is it? that's specifically unique to your body because each one of us has a unique language. For some people, it's heart racing. For other people, it's sweating. For some people, uh, and I would say this for the Irish culture, they flush, they turn red. Mm -hmm. and, and the hard part about that is that you know at the same time people outside you know that something just got you out of your comfort zone. So that covers a lot from the emotional side and I think that's important to understand because I know in the book you go through anxiety and anger and stuck in sadness depression grief so I think the start of that for a lot of people is understanding what's going on in your body your body keeps the score whether you know it or not but that's for right. those who are outside of that side and I want to pull it into the physical because I'm massively biased here as a fitness professional that <laughs> if you can control you control the physical side not that emotional and mental isn't equally important they are but i've always came that that's your foundation when you're feeling good you're fueling your body you're sleeping you're moving it's easier to check in emotionally then and it's easier to check in mentally with what's going on talk to us about food as fuel sleep in your way to health and the joy of movement and again i won't put my preference on this because i have my one that i i'm so biased towards but if you had to put them in an order of importance Nia, what would you say people should focus on first? Obviously, all three are going to be massive when it comes to Huge. dealing with stress management and burnout. But if you had to put them into an order of importance, which way would you go? Within the physical? Within the movement, sleep and food, particularly. Okay. 
So here's the good news. I want you to do whichever one you are most drawn to, because that's the one you have the best chance at keeping in routine with. And the one that you are most drawn to is where you have the most energy. Now, here's the good news. They're all connected. So wherever you start, it will affect the others. Let me tell you what I'm saying. So let's suppose. All right. First, uh, let's let's start with sleep. I'm going to give you some fun facts. I'm going to tie them all together. Fun facts. What happens when you sleep? A lot of people think, oh, I can just cut my sleep. If I don't have enough time, I'll just sleep an hour less. I'll sleep. Okay. Well, you're right that sleep is a waste of time if what you're focusing on is your external to-do list. But your body actually has an internal to-do list that it must take care of each night. Here's the three main things that happen when you sleep. Number one, physical repair. So if you've worked out, muscles get repaired. If you, your immune system is being scanned and strengthened so that you don't get an infection. Number two, memory consolidation. So everything that's gone on during the day gets integrated and cemented into your being when you sleep. Number three, emotional processing. Any stress, emotional discomfort, any of that, all of that is getting processed. It's like a, a flush to what we call your limbic system in your brain. If you do not get enough sleep, your body must prioritize what it actually gets done. And what do you think it prioritizes? Emotional processing. Most people think it's physical repair. But it's not. That's why at, when you don't get enough sleep, you wake up, you're exhausted a few days of that and you're going to fall sick. Why? Because the emotional, the uh, immune repair gets put down after emotional processing. So that's one important thing to know about sleep. Now, let's talk about movement, the joy of movement. There's something called ATP. That's the energy currency of your body. It's adenosine and triphosphate. OK, three phosphates. Can't really do a good uh, organic chemistry model here. But when you work out to get energy, the adenosine breaks off from the three phosphates. And that adenosine goes up to your brain and helps you sleep better. So you, what's been studied the most are 20 to 30 minutes of walking and jogging, lifts your mood as much as an antidepressant. There's your connection to emotional. So you get a mood lift. Your adenosine breaks off from the three phosphates. You sleep better. If you sleep better, you bet you're going to have the energy to make a meal, to nourish yourself instead of grabbing that quick fix of energy that's like any energy you can grab, right? So I don't know how to make them more important than the other, but here's what I'd say. Routine matters. The, your body thrives on routine. So if whatever you do, you can start saying, I go to bed at 1030 or 11 at night, I wake up at six or seven, get your seven to nine hours of not just quantity sleep, but quality sleep. Your body needs to go on a rhythm so that it can take care of its inner to do list so that you can get up in the world and take care of your outer to do list. The other thing that happens is this is the last thing I'll say on this is you have a rise and fall of cortisol and this is all tied to your hormones. So you wake up in the morning when your cortisol is at its peak. That's what makes you wake up. When you wake up, it's so good for you to see sunlight first thing in the morning. That's so good for you. It sends a whole cascade of biochemical reactions in your body that tells your body time to do the external to-do list. Throughout the day, there's a curve. It's like a hump. There's a picture of this in the book as well, but there's a diagram that shows you the natural fall of cortisol throughout the day, which is why near the end of the day, you want to stop the stimulation of computers and devices and things like that because the cortisol starts to go down and that's what makes you want to go to sleep. So you need rhythm. If you do not have this, you will be doing things like, and then you go to sleep and during your sleep, the cortisol gets restored, at which point you wake up again. When you don't give yourself enough sleep, you know what you're doing? The first thing you need is coffee. Why? Because coffee bumps your cortisol. So it's all connected in a really amazing, fascinating way. And the most important thing to everybody who's listening is go where you have the most energy 
interest and excitement to keep things going because it will positively affect the others. That's so beautifully said that they, whichever one you pick will have a positive impact on the others. I've always had, let me rephrase, in more recent years, in the past six or seven, sleep has been what I call my true force multiplier. It's the one it's that big. when I sleep, it, it's big. Like I wake up feeling fresh. I can move. I can train better, which leads to better food choices, which leads to more productivity, leads to more presentness and has this positive feedback loop on all areas of my life. But for some, it might be looking at their food first or looking at their yeah. uh, movement first. And then that's what kicks on this positive change. Something that's really interesting, just I think is important for people to know because I did this, is timing of stimulants, timing of caffeine. And you talked earlier about that caffeine sugar combo that it's so easy <laughs> to fa fall into that because we've all done it. Like I think there's probably 99% of people <laughs> listening who have gone, right, I need coffee or a Red Bull or a can of Monster and a Snickers yep. and a Mars bar because I'm just exhausted. Yep. I just want to show and explain and get you to talk, Neha, to... There's going to be energy drops during the week. When we're talking about burnout, we're talking about this consecutive, consistent pattern versus just being tired. From your experience, do people sometimes get it confused? Because I've had people say, I'm burned out. And then when they give me a list of symptoms, I'm like, you're not burned out. You're just eating really poorly. Or you're not burned out. You're just sleeping poorly. And if we fix that, you're going to be addressed and probably fixed in the next week or so. Do people get it confused in terms of the spectrum of burnout and they mislabel it? And the reason I talk about labeling, and I know labeling is for foods and sometimes labeling things can be really um, a poor choice of approach for people, but does mislabeling burnout when they're actually not fully at the end of the spectrum where they need to make all these changes at once is that something you come across regularly or what are some of the misconceptions you see with it? Sure. So the way after burning out myself and for 20 years, helping other people start to heal from this. And here's what I want to tell people. Don't think I don't still burn out sometimes. There are times that even with everything I know and having written a book, I push myself too far over time. I, what, what changes is I pick it up early and I adjust course. That's what the change is. Now, burnout, the way that I've defined it after two decades of studying this and experimenting and figuring things out with patients and myself is burnout, wherever you are from burned out to fully charged can be determined by whether you have a net gain or a net drain of energy on a physical, mental, emotional, social, and spiritual level. Anywhere you're having a net drain, think about it, in your relationships, in your bank account, in your body's energy, it's not sustainable. A net drain is not sustainable. And once, just like I told you that each of the individual areas underneath physical are connected, so too are physical, mental, emotional, social, and spiritual all interconnected. The, the one example that I've already given you is if you start moving, 20 to 30 minutes a day walking and jo or jogging, your mood lifts. So now physical has impacted emotional, okay? So wherever, the most important thing is that you figure out where you're having a net drain. When we were in the middle of the pandemic, a lot of people were having a net drain socially. That was the big drain, right? For some people, they thought, ooh, this is the first time I'm having a net gain socially. I don't wanna be around all those people. <laughs> So it's different for everybody. And so what you want it, and it's different today than it was six months ago. So you have to have a way. And Brian, we'll give your listeners what I gave everybody on my book tour, which was their own way to do a personal assessment. And I will walk them through in a, in a video series how to fill it out in a really accurate way so they can always get a 15 minute pulse check. Where am I now? Where am I having a net drain? Because knowing where you're having a net gain and a net drain at any given point is what really matters. Now, I'm going to connect. I already told you that if you move, you elevate your mood. Okay, let me let me stay on the connection of physical to emotional. Okay, I can go to any of these, but physical to emotional. So let's say someone had a breakup. Let's say there was an unexpected experience. They didn't get the promotion that they wanted to. They were working really hard. They didn't get the award, whatever it is. Disappointment. When I feel disappointed, 
If I have never learned how to navigate and bring words to this feeling inside me of all those physical sensations I'm asking you to tune into, right? Your body's unique language. I just feel awful inside. And all I know is if I grab chocolate, I'm going to feel better instantly. If I go out and I have a, a glass of wine or three and with my buddies, I'm going to feel better, right? And so what we do are these short-term fixes that are actually happening on a different level. So if I'm emotionally upset, what I ask people around their food is, tell me what your comfort food is. What is it? And they'll tell me exactly what it is. It's coffee, toffee, crunch, this brand, this beer, this name, ice cold, right? They know exactly what's going to shift them. Okay. They're using that food for a reason. There's a reason that specific thing is taking care of them. So what I do is I do a mindfulness exercise. Everybody go grab your comfort food. This is going to like horrify Brian. Well, grab your comfort food, okay? Now, what I want you to do is I want you to look at it. I want you to slow down. I want you to smell it, touch it, taste it. Be very mindful of this. And as you're doing it, I want you to notice what happens to your salivary glands. I want you to notice, have you ever slowed down and really looked at this thing that comforts you, okay? And then I want you to just take one bite of it and tell me the emotion or emotions that you feel when it hits your taste buds. Some people say, I feel comforted, I feel loved, I feel safe. Okay, well listen, there is not enough chocolate chip, mint chocolate chip ice cream in the world to have you feel those things, which is why we keep using them as a short-term fix. So what I'd say is, the question you wanna flip and answer for yourself is, where in your life do you feel unsafe, where do you feel uncomfortable and where do you feel unloved? Because the, that's how you're going to be able to shift. And then you're not going to need the mint chocolate chip ice cream. You're going to choose it when you want to celebrate because you want the, to taste it. But you won't need it. So that's one example of how physical is connected to emotional. Oh, that's so on par with things we've talked about in the past, in particularly solo episodes, Nehab, when it comes to food, because when I'm working with clients with their nutrition, it's normally body composition, so weight loss, fat loss, etc. But I'm all for every food is on the table, pardon the pun, they can have whatever they want. It's the reason <laughs> behind it. Like, That's you know, right. if you're out for, like there's a big difference between having a bowl of ice cream when you're out with your family or friends at the end of a nice dinner compared to I've been really stressed. I need this food right now because I've had a really bad day at work because That's one right. of those is very emotional driven. The other is very social driven. Same food, different context. And it's funny as you mentioned it because I was picturing my food at the minute I'm on kind of like a honeycomb chocolate buzz. Um, but, it, <laughs> for, for, but yeah, I know. As soon as you said it, and I was like, What's just, that's my food at the minute. But it's for me, it's overwhelm. When I get overwhelmed and feel like I've taken too much on my plate, that food makes me feel safe, which just sounds that's so right. peculiar. But, but that that's check-in, right. we just did it in real time. So now next time that overwhelmed feeling comes, I'm going to do that mindfulness. So from a personal standpoint, I want to thank you for that because that's really useful in terms of a practical tip. Brian, why do you feel safe? You know why you feel safe? Because you have something that can change how you feel. You're the one in control again. So that's a yeah. really important thing. None of these are bad. They're not good or bad. They're very useful strategies. We're, we should pat ourselves on the back for these amazing strategies that we've learned to get us through. Now when we know better, we'll do better. We'll be curious about it. We'll make different choices. Sometimes we'll make the same choice because we're aware of it and we say, you know what? This is what I want to do right now. Right. But we want people to just be conscious of what's happening for them so they can make choices. If they, if they don't know that they're doing it, they can't make the connection between emotional and physical. They will think that they're a failure because they keep trying to cut it out, but then they need it again. Right. And they're it's not a, cop a coping mechanism. Yeah. It's it, a coping it ends mechanism. Up yeah. So thank yourself for being creative, for coming up with something that works, for surviving in a world that is moving way, way too fast for our biology. 
Yeah, I think you're one of the things that's so misunderstood or in again, focus group of one here is people need to be kinder to themselves and nicer to themselves. And as you mentioned, they're speaking to themselves and thanking yourself for having came up with this support mechanism to help you cope with difficulty in life. Although it might not be serving you anymore, it might be time to replace it and do something else instead. But thank that's yourself right. for getting it to that point. I think taking that kindness and a niceness towards yourself is definitely an underrated tool. I want to talk on one final thing, and there's so much in the book here. I'm going to link in the description for people because those who are struggling with burnout, it's a very deep topic when it comes to the physical, emotional side, the mental side, the spiritual side, the social side, which we haven't even touched on. But I think it all intertwines. So for those who are struggling, this is going to be a tool that's going to massively support you because you can unpack it as you go through. I want to touch on something that again, was an issue for me, but is also one that I tend to see as a trend with people. And that's establishing boundaries, particularly ones that honor your priorities, because exercising my quote unquote, no muscle on people pleasing and saying yes to things I should be saying no to is historically something I struggled with. And that for me was either the first or the second step towards burnout in a lot of situations. I've been able to catch it in more recent years, but for those who struggle to establish boundaries, talk to us about the importance of that, particularly when it comes to honoring their priorities and whatever that is in their life. Sure. So um, I did an entire podcast on people pleasing with Mel Robbins. Do you know Mel Robbins? Great episode. Yeah. I listened to it before this, yeah. <laughs> so because we're covering like a piece of this, they know that they're gonna get a burnout assessment for themselves. So they're gonna be able to figure this out. The second is, I'll even give you the, the free gifts that I gave with Mel's group, where they can go deeper into boundaries uh, on this. But I wanna give you the overview, it's chapter 18. It boils down to the same thing we were talking about before, which is belonging. Remember how we said this with the world? We, we are born into a world that we want to belong in. Belonging is as important in our DNA as the need for water and food and sleep, and we need to belong. And so boundaries are tricky because we have to know where we end and another begins. But when we were little, our ability to make other people smile, get affection from them, determined how quick our diaper got changed, how quickly we got fed or picked up from a nap. So w growing up, we blur our boundaries with the parent figures in our lives, our caretakers. We want our siblings, our older siblings to include us and be proud of us. We go into school, we wanna get an A. We go into our teenage years, we want our peers to think our, our kicks are cool and our, our clothes are amazing. And, and then we transfer it to our work environment and our life partners and whoever we're dating, and right? And then we do it again to our children. So we're in a world where we just keep transferring who we want to belong to and who we adjust ourselves for. If this is you, what I want you to know is, congratulations, you are someone who cares deeply about belonging. Boundaries come in in multiple ways. There's boundaries that can be too rigid. There's boundaries that can be too porous. You just kind of let them go. Or there's boundaries that feel just right. And they can change throughout your life. Boundaries are about when that discomfort that you feel in your body, when you're a little uncomfortable because you shift out of your body. For me, my throat constricts, jaw constricts, my heart starts racing, my stomach's turning, whatever it is. If you don't have the ability to breathe through it and sit with that discomfort, you will give in to whatever else needs to happen in the moment and give up yourself for another. So, this is really about us learning how to sit in the discomfort of our own body to figure out what do we need? And then of course you care about what other people want and what they need. But in the end, turn up the sound of your own heart slightly louder than you can hear the voices of others when you make a decision. So you have to include yourself in the equation. And if you're out there listening and you're like, oh, I'm a people pleaser, oh, I always want harmony, then you gotta ask yourself, am I someone who cannot tolerate conflict? 
And I would rather make, so Brian, between me and you, if there's conflict, okay, if conflict is sitting between us and I avoid it because I don't want to feel this discomfort, guess what? The conflict doesn't go away. It grows bigger and it changes location. Now it moves from being between us because I don't bring it up with you. It moves to being inside me. Now at night, I'm brushing my teeth. I'm looking in the mirror and I'm like, oh, you should have said something to Brian. Why didn't you say something? You didn't. Do now the, the conflict becomes inner conflict. So it doesn't go away because you don't say it. It literally shifts location and now it's within you. I, as a doctor, am going to say something pretty bold, which is stress causes or exacerbates more than 80% of all illness. I cannot tell you over the last few decades how many times people's physical health has to break down in order for them to realize that the social relationships in their life, they've outgrown them. They have been holding down or suppressing emotions. Their mental thought patterns are very damaging to themselves. The way they talk to themselves is a way that they would never allow anybody else to talk to them. And when we ignore or do not resolve or are unaware of issues going on mentally, emotionally, socially, and spiritually for ourselves, eventually it will show up in your physical body to get your attention. Ooh, that's a real mic drop, Neha, for people in terms of if you don't deal with the problem now, it's going to manifest in another way or transference, as you mentioned there, that the conflict that you're not handling in your external world is eventually going to get turned internally. You spoke directly to me there. And a couple of things I need to check in with off the back of this podcast because that, that really <laughs> hit home in, in a very positive way. Uh, Nia, I'm, just before we get on to the final question, I mentioned I'm going to link the book for people. There's so much in here. We've only touched on the surface of burnout and all the areas. And when it comes to comprehensiveness, and in alignment with people that have listened to this podcast, it's covering all angles, which I love. It was literally the reason I wanted to chat to you on the podcast was because you're covering so many different angles, not just the physical and not just the conflict avoidance and, and one area of burnout. It's literally the holistic approach. For anyone that's listening, I'll link the book, as I mentioned, it'll be on Amazon. They can click straight through. Is there anywhere else you want to send them to here before I get on to the last question? Yeah, I think we should, if anybody here is thinking, yeah, I avoid conflict, I think we should give them, I will give your group a free link to the, my audio book on my book on conflict. Uh, how, it's called Talk RX, Five Steps to Honest Conversations that Create Connection, Health, and Happiness. Let's give them a free link to that audio book if they would like it. If you know that conflict is where you want to go, and if you're saying, oh my God, how is my physical health connected to everything else? That's in there. So let's give them, let's give them that. So we're going to give them a free assessment for burnout. We're going to give them an audio book to my TalkRx book. And intuitiveintelligenceinc.com is where you can find me on social. I'm at Dr. Neha, D-O-C-T-O-R-N-E-H-A, and Neha Sangwan, MD, on LinkedIn. Amazing. And I will link those in the show notes on brankyfitness.com and in the description for the podcast for anyone that wants to click on through. Final sure. question that I want to ask, and you can take this in any direction that you like, but okay. what's something about burnout or burning out in general that you know now that you wish you knew back then? Anything that jumps out in terms of getting from zero to one for you or for others that you wish, I, I, if I could go back, I would have started here and I would have progressed this way. Hmm. What a thoughtful question. So the first thing is, you're not alone. The second thing is, this is not at all a failure. It is literally the doorway to true alignment in your heart and with other people. And if you want, choose to walk through this and listen to the call, you will literally become a role model for people in your life because they will see you living an authentic life. So start by listening to your body because your body is where it all begins. 
And I, I agree, um, Brian, I would say if you just want them to do one thing, if you're not getting seven to nine hours of sleep, just add 30 minutes on to wherever you are and give yourself one week to notice how differently you feel when you allow your body to help you. Amazing. I think a takeaway for anybody that's listening, give yourself those extra 30 minutes and just see that positive compound effect over time. Dr. Neha, I can't thank you enough for your time. So many things for me to personally think about off the back of this podcast because there was definitely some layered questions in there and answers. Um, and I will link everything as I mentioned in the show notes. Keep up the inspiring work. Thank you so much for writing this book and getting it out there. And I'll chat to you again soon. Brian, thank you. And thanks to everybody listening. There you have it, internal medicine physician Dr. Neha Sanguin on burning out emotional energy drains and why burnout is not a personal failure, it's a wake-up call. Some definite food for thought for me off the back end of this podcast. Something that's been coming into my space quite a lot recently is how if you don't listen to your body's internal cues, it can manifest itself in physical sickness, etc. Talked a little bit about this with the episode with Dr. Bradley Nelson as well um, and a few other guests that are coming up. So this is in my space a lot, so it might be the same for you. So definitely worth checking in with and reflecting on. Hopefully you enjoyed today's podcast. If you did, make sure you leave a rate wherever you listen to podcasts or a review if you listen on Apple Podcasts. That's everything from me from today's podcast. Thanks for listening. Catch you all next Monday.